Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth. And today I wanted to get back into a series that I had um, started a while ago and actually haven't really added too much. And that is my series on uh, the verses that Arminians like to use against Calvinists. And today I thought I'd go ahead and talk about 1 Timothy 2.4. Um, it's a host, uh, one of a, a host of different passages that a lot of Armenians tend to think is pretty strong evidence in their case. And um, I recognize that most of my Armenian friends are not going to be convinced by what I have to say here, but hopefully they'll recognize at the end of this that the situation is a little bit more complex than they sometimes try to make it out to be. But before we get into all the complexities, let's just go ahead and read the passage. And it is always a good idea when you're studying the Bible, uh, try to get a little bit of context for the verse. So we're going to actually start at the beginning of the chapter, and then we'll read down into verse 4 just so that we get a, a broader context of what's going on here. All right, so 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV translation. As you can see, I have the, the Greek text here on the right. Uh, let's go ahead and get into this. Paul says, that's who wrote uh, 1 Timothy. Paul says, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus, uh, sorry, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. All right, so I read the first uh, six verses of the chapter there. All of 1 Timothy is, of course, awesome. Um, but we simply don't have time to discuss every single thing there. But what we need to discuss uh, for this conversation will be found in those first six verses. And where Armenians generally focus is, of course, 1 Timothy 2.4, but also 2.6 comes up as well. So we'll go ahead and we'll kind of tag team them and get both of them. In verse 4 it says, Who desires, this is speaking of uh, God, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, how does this come up in the, the Armenian versus Calvinist um, discussion? Well, in Calvinism, we believe in this thing called particular redemption. That is, that Christ died for a specific people who would be saved, uh, not for everyone. And there is this thing of, uh, there is this concept of election uh, that the Bible talks about, say, in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, you also get the same idea of uh, predestinate, uh, predestining and foreknowing and things like that going on in Romans 8. Um, you have God's sovereign will to use and do with people as he sees fit in Romans 9. Um, you, have, you have the requirements of God having to draw people in John chapter 6, things like that. All of these contribute to uh, the Calvinist understanding that uh, Christ died for a specific people, not for all people, and that God does not intend to save everyone. That is, that some people are going to be left in their sins, which they will be perfectly happy to remain in. Uh, that is, that sinners love sin. Um, it's not the case that they're, you know, they're screaming out and and agony as they go to hell, most of them are dancing their way to hell in perfect blissful glee because that's what they want. Not to say that when they get there they'll be happy, but uh, sinners love to sin, is the Calvinist point of view. But God reaches into the lives of certain of these sinners who love to sin, and he turns them towards himself. That's what the doctrine of election is. Man has a sinful nature that he loves. He loves to sin, and God who sees these people who are hurtling towards hell, he reaches out and he takes uh, uh, some of them, one by one turns them to himself. Okay. Um, and so, but how does that relate to the text here? Well, the text here says God desires all people to be saved. If the doctrine of election is true, wouldn't it, shouldn't this say that God desires certain people to be saved, some people to be saved, something along those lines. But that's not what it says. Here it says all people. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so this is 
you know, a point of conflict between Calvinists and Arminians. Arminians say, you know, God is trying to save everyone, but because we have a choice, you know, most of us are going to make the wrong choice and uh, reject God. He wants us to come to him, but we choose not to go to him. And the Calvinist says, no, we love sin, naturally, and we're never going to choose God unless he himself puts a new nature in us, by which we can be turned and so be saved. But this verse, it seems like it's really strong on the Armenian side, right? It says, God desires all people to be saved. That really seems like that's the Armenian position. Well, Calvinists, they full well know that this verse is there. They read their Bibles too. It sh this verse shows up in our Bible just as much as it does there, along with verse 6 here, uh, which says that Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. In Calvinism, of course, there's that particular redemption that he died for certain people, those who would be saved. He didn't die for all people. So that would seem to be on the Armenian side as well. Two verses in the same chapter that seem to lend themselves to an Armenian interpretation. It's not looking good so far, is it? Well, this is where we get into a lot of our, our basic principles of hermeneutics and interpretation. First rule, of course, is recognizing um, that every English translation is just that, it's a translation. When you want, when you come to a, a particular point of doctrine uh, that's being contested, because there are verses you can quote on either side. Like I said, the, the Calvinists have all of theirs, you know, there's Romans 9, Romans 8, John 6, you know, all the different, uh, Ephesians 1, all the different passages that a, a Calvinist uh, could quote, and those are just a very small sampling um, about this. And so there's verses on one side, verses on the other. If you're going to come to a specific idea, uh, a specific result, and a proper idea of what's going on, you're going to have to actually get into the original text. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on here. So it says, all people, in verse 4, and in the Greek over here, that's pantas anthropos. And then in verse 6, you have a similar construction. You have panton, referring to the all. Okay, so that is what is going on in the Greek. In each case, you have um, this uh, Greek word that's showing up, uh, pos, different inflected forms of uh, the word pos, pos, pos upon, and its various inflected forms uh, that's showing up in the text. And uh, this is where that all comes from. And so we need to understand, does that original Greek word always mean all in the expansive sense, or is it sometimes limited? And if it's sometimes limited, then the question becomes, should it be here? All right. Now, just on the basis of an English translation, we actually do have evidence in the English that interpreting it as an expansive all, all, all actually isn't all that useful. Let's go to another book that is by the same author. At least if you're a biblical Christian, you would believe it's by the same author. If you're one of the liberal secularists, you wouldn't believe that these are necessarily by Paul or even by the same author, but we do. And so I'm not going to take the time to address those arguments. If you want to not believe that um, Paul wrote these, then by all means, join the, the secularists. Um, but don't call yourself a, a biblical Christian in that case. All right, so let's go to another book that was written by Paul, and that would be the book of Titus. And in Titus 2.11, um, Paul actually winds up using the same kind of construction. In 2.11, he says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. And over here in the Greek, we have the pasen anthropois. It's just a different inflected form, but it's the same uh, basic construction here. You still have that variant of pas uh, that's still in uh, the Greek there that's representing the all. But how is it that this calls into the question whether or not this is an expansive sense? Well, notice what it says here. It says, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. This is interesting because neither the classical Calvinist nor the classical Armenian uh, believes that salvation is for all people. That is, they believe that there will be people who will not be saved. That is, in the Armenian case, it's those people who um, had the choice to choose God but chose not to. In the Calvinist case, it's those people who remained in uh, their sin and loved uh, their sin. 
uh, that God did not turn towards himself. Uh, either case, they believe that not everyone's going to be saved. This verse here, as it's translated, would seem to be uh, completely different from either system. This would be what you would call a universalist system. Everybody's going to be saved. But neither Calvinists nor Armenians believe that. And for good reason. There's lots of texts in the Bible that are very specific about the fact that there are going to be people who will be eternally condemned. If you don't believe me, read through the last couple of chapters of Revelation, for example, as well as various other passages in uh, the Bible uh, that are very specific about the fact that in the end, there will be people who are uh, given over to eternal torment, uh, to eternal punishment, to eternal wrath from God. Um, the Bible is really clear about all of this. And so... Unless you're going to become a universalist, which neither classical Armenians nor classical uh, Calvinists are, um, we are confronted with the fact that all can't mean all. That is, we start really wondering whether or not that Greek word, that pos, uh, really does mean all every single time. Because here, that leads to an interpretation that is well outside of Calvinism and Armenianism. Um, it doesn't seem like it would match what the rest of the Bible has to say about the fact that there are people who are not going to be saved. It says bringing salvation for all people, doesn't it? Well, that seems like that would be a problem. So, this is where we see the need for looking into the original language more. Okay. It's obvious, even in the English, that something is going on here, that there's, there's a conflict between what certain passages say about people being saved or not, all people being saved or not, and this particular verse. This lets us know that there's probably something going on in the original language that we need to be aware of. So let's go ahead and look up what pos can mean. Okay, now this particular entry is of course uh, from Strong's and I apologize for that. Um, it starts out with Strong's Concordance up here, but let's go ahead and get down into Thayer's. Thayer's is a little bit better um, lexicon for Greek. And here we're using it uh, in the an anarthrous uh, sense, and that is there's uh, no definite article that's being used in these germane passages. And there's three options. It can mean any or every, which would support the Armenian uh, claim. I'm going to skip this one because it's the one I want to come back to. It can also mean the whole, uh, which would also support the Armenian claim. Uh, but the one that's of interest to us, especially given what Second Titus, not Second Titus, blah, Titus chapter 2, yeah, that, that word is kind of important where you put the two there, uh, where Titus chapter 2 says that, all, that Christ brought salvation for everyone, and we're thinking it might not be everyone because other passages would seem to say something different, and we look up here, and lo and behold, that's actually one of the options here. Where the all that's being talked about by pos can actually mean every kind, all kinds. It doesn't mean all in the expansive sense. It's talking about all, uh, all kinds, all manner of, if you want to use a, a more traditional uh, phraseology. Uh, it doesn't always mean every single one. Sometimes, indeed, it is restricted. Now, this is a fairly minor use uh, the vast majority of the time that you see POS being used, it's going to be an any or every. It's going to be a whole, and of course, if you're talking about other contexts, that is, with the article definition two, it's all, the whole, etc., etc. Most of the time, it actually is expansive, so this is a fairly minor use of it. And so you would expect that most of the time when this gets translated, um, most translators are going to default to saying all or every. Um, because that's how it's used most of the, most of the time. Um, but there, are, from time to time, you will get translators who decide to go through and be a little bit more uh, thorough, and they'll notice places where all doesn't actually mean all in the expansive sense. Instead, of, instead it means all kinds, all manner of something. A good example of uh, this uh, shows up in the NESB translation of Matthew 4.23. Now, it annoys me that the NESB is not consistent on this one. In fact, I've looked at you know different translations, and none of them are consistent on how they translate this, which is probably what contributes to most of the problems 
uh, that Calvinists and Armenians have when they're talking about this. Um, but here's one case where uh, translators happen to notice that the all was not being used in the expansive sense. So Matthew uh, 4.23, some translations will say it this way, some won't. Um, some of them notice the difference because, like I said, most of the time it's all or every. Uh, this is a specific usage. But NASB translators happen to notice it here. Matthew 4.23 says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Now you look it up in the Greek and it doesn't have a, a Greek antecedent for kind. That is, it's implied. Uh, in the Greek text, you're just going to see the pos there, which would mean you know, each, every, or all, the vast majority of the time that it's used in the Greek New Testament text. But here, um, they started thinking about it a little bit, it seems like, and translators don't always think about the broader ramifications of the things that they translate. But here, they were going uh, through and thinking about it and saying, okay, what is this saying? Is it saying that he was healing all the different kinds of diseases that there were, that he showed that he was able to heal leprosy, that it was able to heal blindness, that he was able to heal lameness, all kinds of diseases? Or does it mean that he went to every single sick person in Galilee who had any kind of affliction and he healed every single one of them? Technically, both of them are possible within the the range of meaning for pos. Pos can mean each, every, all. It can mean every single person that uh, that qualifier applies to. But it also can mean every manner of thing that that uh, qualifier applies to. And where do you go? You have to look at the context and see which one makes uh, sense. And what's interesting here is that Matthew uh, distinguishes between disease and sickness. That is, he's separating things into categories, and it's a small separation. We wouldn't have a whole lot of difference between disease and sickness. But nonetheless, Matthew is making a distinction here. He's separating things out. And so what, and so the NASB translators looked at it and said, well, there's a distinction that's happening here. Odds are it's being translated according to that one small, we should translate it according to that one small meaning uh, that doesn't get used very often for pos. And so they say healing every kind of disease. That is, they would understand it as saying that Jesus didn't go to every single sick person who was in Galilee, but that all the kinds of sickness that were brought before him, he could heal. The emphasis is on the applicability of Christ's powers, not the universality of them. That is, they applied to every kind of case that was out there. That does not mean that they applied to every case. Jesus healed many of all kinds, but he did not heal every single person who was sick in Galilee which seems like that would be a fairly straightforward meaning from uh, the context and also from a practical point of view. Um, even though we certainly would believe that Jesus could heal everyone if he wanted to just with a single thought. Um, but what we see more often in the, the Gospels is Jesus healing particular people that he encounters. So it seems appropriate that the emphasis would be on the kinds of of illnesses that were brought before him rather than the extent of everyone who was saved. Um, well, in Titus, everyone who was saved, but here, everyone who was healed. So it's definitely something that's within the possibility, and we see that it can get translated that way. But like I said, when I look this up in different translations, it's not consistent across all translations, and the same translation does not always uh, translate the same construct the same way. And like I said, it's because it's a little tiny thing. Out of all of the different ways that Thayer's and other lexicons will give for how you can translate POS, this is literally just one, and the rest of them, everything else that we have here, is expansive. It's one isolated usage that isn't expansive. So it would make sense that a lot of translators are going to miss this because pretty much in the vast majority of times in the New Testament, you're not going to see it translated. You're not going to see it where the meaning is obviously being limited. But this does uh, give us uh, some kind of a basis for asking whether or not it's being used in a limited basis in First Timothy.
in Titus, we'll, we'll start uh, there first, it seems like it would be appropriate for having all people. Um, uh, just because of what Armenians and Calvinists would understand about salvation itself, that not everyone is going to be uh, saved. So that right there would tell us, unless you want to become a universalist, that at least here, when it says all people, the emphasis really should be on all kinds of people. Okay. And, of course, this verse 11 here, reading it contextually, it comes after a description of different kinds of people. Okay, so starting back in verse 1, like you really should do with uh, all of these passages, you always go back a ways to make sure you get in the context. Let's see what kind of things are being done, whether distinctions are being brought in for, the, for people or whether people are always talked about universally. So verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. There's no mention of people so far. Uh, two, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Uh, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, not showing, uh, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Okay, so, what do we have going on there? Did Paul always leave it in the universal sense when he was talking about people, or did he start breaking things into categories? He started breaking things into categories. We have older men, we have older women, we have younger men, we have younger women, we have bond servants, we have masters. And so this context of taking people and breaking them into categories is what is going to inform our understanding of verse 11. And this is the reason why we're not universalists. That is, we understand that Paul has been breaking things into categories, so when we read this, and we know from the lexicon that of every kind, all manner of, and also from those translations that do happen to catch it. Like I said, it's a rare thing that they catch it because it's a teeny tiny usage that doesn't show up very often for this particular word, but sometimes they do catch it. And so we know it is a legitimate translation, at least in certain cases. Uh, we can make a really good argument here that when it says all people, it's actually referring to all kinds of people. That seems to be the most straightforward answer. We have it being broken up into categories before. We know it's a possible translation of this word. And shy of becoming a universalist, that means that's how you would have to translate it here. All kinds of people. He brought salvation for all kinds of people. Not everyone is going to be saved. Calvinists, Armenians would both agree on that. And the meaning of the word and its immediate context would suggest that that is indeed the meaning. All right, so going back to 1 Timothy, does that also apply? That is, do we have the necessary components here? We have a word that can be uh, translated as all kinds, every manner of, something to that effect, or every kind of, as we saw with the NESB translation. We saw it's a possibility, but before we jump into saying that that's actually what's going on here, we have to be able to say that the conditions are basically the same. Otherwise, you're just pulling definitions out of thin air. In Titus, we saw that categorization had happened beforehand. That was in the context. Even in Matthew 4.23, there was a distinctions that were being made on what was going on, disease and sickness. That is, there were subtleties that were being introduced that would lead us to believe that the all there was a distinction of kind, uh, was uh, referring to kinds of uh, problems, kinds of illnesses, whether it be disease or sickness in general. Um, rather than being a universal statement. So we have to show that there's some kind of a distinction that's being made in the context. Otherwise, I have to uh, agree with the Armenians on this one that it would support their point of view. Unless we can show that the preconditions that exist in Titus and in 
uh, Matthew 4.23 exist here. We have to have the appropriate word, okay, otherwise you can't translate it that way, and we've looked in the Greek to look at 1 Timothy 4 here, and we do have uh, the pantas, the inflected form, the same inflected form that we see in Titus 2.11, not the same inflected form, but the same word that has a different inflected form here, which is pasin. So we have the same word. In Titus, we saw categories. In Matthew 4, we saw categories. It wasn't a very big thing, but there were categories that were mentioned. There was disease and sickness. So in 1 Timothy, do we see categorization happening with regard to people? All right, so going back to verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. There are no categories that are being made yet. Verse 2. For kings and all who are in high positions, so there's kings and those who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. All right, so we actually do have a distinction that is being made here. Kings and who are all um, and all who are in high positions. So Paul is now breaking things up. So using the same principles that we'd have before, when we see pas again, we're going to assume that it's being used in that same context of categorization. So in verse 4, where it says, who desires all people to be saved, it would be entirely appropriate, given what we've seen in Titus, unless you're going to become a universalist, and in Matthew uh, 423, unless you're going to argue that Jesus was going around uh, healing every single person in Galilee who had any kind of disease or sickness, unless you're going to argue for those things, then the consistent interpretation of 1 Timothy 4 would be that this should be all kinds of people, if we're going to interpret it in a way that's you know consistent across the board with all these other texts. This is why Calvinists are not convinced by Armenian appeals to uh, 1 Timothy 2.4. That is, if I take 1 Timothy 2.4 and I interpret it universally, then I would have to um, interpret that same construction where it shows up in other places universally, where categories are being made, but I don't look at the categories, I just assume it's a universal, which means that I would have to interpret Titus 2.11 as meaning universalism, everyone's going to be saved, which is obviously not the case from other biblical passages. Like I said, um, Revelation, the end of Revelation is a really good place to look for that. And that's not something that Armenians and Calvinists disagree on. We would both agree in saying that Christ isn't going to wind up saving everyone, nor did he save everyone. Um, we're not universalists, so that's a problem. And then also, I don't know too many Armenians who would actually try to make the argument that Jesus went around and saved every single ill person in Galilee. Okay. Both of those together seem like it's pretty strong evidence that um, that wasn't the case. All right, so we have looked at it. Um, in context with other verses, making sure that we're interpreting things across the board, and you can make a really strong argument that it should be all kinds, unless you want to become a universalist and say that Jesus went around to literally every single ill person in Galilee and healed them. And that's what Matthew meant to communicate, and that's what Paul meant to communicate in Titus, that every single person everywhere was going to be saved. And then, like I mentioned, uh, verse 6 also gets brought up in this, so we'll go ahead and we'll bring it in here. And it's talking about Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Well, we have that word all again. Looking it up in the Greek word, it's pampon. It's still a variant of pos, so we have the same kind of thing going on. Um, so, again... Like I said, pause most of the time, yeah, it does mean every, each, every, all. But there are limited times, like we saw in Thayer's uh, lexicon here, where it can uh, indeed mean of every kind or all manner of. It's fairly important. So in 2.6, we have to make the distinction. 
which one is it? Is it meant in the universal sense, like all uh, pos normally is meant? Or is this one of those cases where it's going to be limited? Now, before, literally just a couple verses back, we saw that it was being used in a limited sense. That is, if we're going to be consistent with Titus and also with Matthew 4.23. So how do we interpret it here, though? Well, if we're going to stay within the passage, within the context, it would say that we have to say that it's limited, that uh, he gave his uh, self as a ransom for all kinds of people. And that would be a sufficiently strong argument. So you're appropriate, uh, interpreting it within context and across context with the Bible, and that would be more than sufficient in any class on hermeneutics whenever you're interpreting a text especially one that originates in another language can you prove that this particular construction should be used this way is that the way that's being used in that context um etc etc all the conditions are met so yes i would say quite confidently that in verse uh, six the all there also means all kinds he died as a ransom for all kinds and frankly all of the other biblical passages that touch on that particular uh, topic of Christ being a ransom for us would agree. Let's look at them here. There are five total um, places in the New Testament which refer to Christ being a ransom for us. Let's go ahead and read the germane verses. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be um, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here it doesn't say that it's for every single person. It's for many, a good many, but not all. Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. It doesn't say all there. Here's the one that we're under consideration here. It's 1 Timothy 2, 6, Who gave himself as a ransom for all, but we already discussed that the word that underlies that all there can actually have a limited meaning based on context. So, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time, but like we said, that all could mean all kinds. But let's look at how the other uh, biblical authors dealt with this. Uh, 1 Peter 1.18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not from perishable things such as silver or gold. He doesn't say that all people were ransomed. Instead, he this is Peter writing to Christians. He's saying that you Christians were ra uh, ransomed from the feudal ways. And he's specifically pe uh, talking to his, of course, specific audience. But he does not put it in a universal sense. He doesn't say you and everyone else were ransomed. It's you. It, there is a specific limitation there, and it is, would be inappropriate to say that when he said you specifically, he really meant you, including the entire world. And then Revelation 5.9 is really specific about it. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you, this is speaking of Christ, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people, not all people, but people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. That one's actually really clear. You ransomed some people from all categories. So based on what we've seen from how all the other New Testament authors deal with this issue of Jesus being our ransom, um, you have Matthew and Mark who both say many instead of all. You have Peter who does not use um, universal language, and you have Revelation, which is very specific about it being from all uh, nations, all tribes, all languages, but not all people, where the all is on the emphasis of kinds. It makes it very clear, at least if we're going to assume that Paul was actually in unity with John, with Peter, with Mark, and with Matthew, that he meant the same thing. He is the ransom for all kinds, but not all universally. Okay, that is the burden of consistency that we have whenever we try to interpret a text. That is, we look at, if an issue comes up, and it might be a very legitimate issue, you have to look at it in detail. That is, look at different places where that same kind of construction appears in the English translation and see if there's anything that seems a little bit wonky. Like I said, when we went to Titus, it seems like it would be a universalist statement. 
So if there's something that you look it up in different places where the same kind of thing is going on and the same kind of phrasing is being used, well, that means there's probably something that's going on in the original language which we need to look up. And granted, uh, we we'll sometimes find that there's little cases like this that are exceptions to the general rule. Because like I said, the rest of Thayer's Greek lexicon, all the other entries, all support some kind of a, a version of each, every, or all universally. Every single one of the other entries that are in there, except for this one particular one here, do contribute to that. But there is an exception, and when wonky things appear, it's probably the exception that's going to mess you up. And so find places where it actually has been translated that way. And like I said, not all translators are going to notice it, especially if you're dealing with this one little case uh, where it can mean that. Yeah, you're not going to see all translators do it. But see if there actually are any translations that do translate it that way in that per in particular case. Try to figure out what the general principles are and then see if you can consistently apply them to all the germane cases. And then also see if when that particular topic is being dealt with, is it being dealt with um, the same way uh, which uh, interpretation would lead to the same kind of qualifications as you find in all the other places. Like I said, there were five passages that had to deal with uh, Jesus being our ransom. And four of those, it's really clear that no universality is being implied. So guess what? That means that if that's a, a possibility for the underlying word, that that's probably what Paul meant. There's no reason to think that he would be at odds with what the others were saying. All right, so that is why Calvinists are not convinced by Armenian appeals to 1 Timothy 2.4. The simple answer, all doesn't always mean all. The vast majority of cases it does. But there are cases where you can go through and you can clearly show that that would not be um, a consistent reading. And you can look at the principles for why you would not use all in that sense, where all would actually have an emphasis on kinds or types rather than on making a universal statement. And that is where the issue of categorization brought up. And we saw that in Matthew 4.23. There was a small categorization that was being brought up, and it actually does get translated that way, at least by some translators. And then we also say the same principle in Titus 2. You look at the material before Titus 2.11, and the people are being broken up into categories. Older men, older women, younger men, younger women, bond servants, masters, all those kinds of things. And then the same thing applies in First Timothy. We look at First Timothy and we actually see that there are distinctions that are being made between, uh, say, kings and all people in high authority, that uh, all other people in high authority, that there is a categorization that is happening here. And then as it relates to 2.6, we looked at it in the context of other ones, found it was perfectly consistent. It is a difficult issue. It's not as clear cut as some people would like. Um, but there is a reason why Calvinists are not um, overly impressed by Armenian appeals to it. Because we know that there is an exception that, uh, for that word, for pos. And we know that all of the conditions necessary for that exception to apply are in their germane text. And you can follow it through with other texts. All right, so thank you very much for listening. For those of you who are in Christ, including my Armenian brothers and sisters, go with Christ and be and blessed. Go with God and be blessed. But for those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to a true understanding of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.